At one of our development programs, an executive reported a situation where a manufacturer was being sued by a long-time industrial customer for lack of performance. Both parties felt totally justified in the rightness of their position and perceived each other as unethical and completely untrustworthy. As they began to practice Habit 5, two things became clear. First, early communication problems resulted in a misunderstanding which was later exacerbated by accusations and counter-accusations. Second, both were initially acting in good faith and didn't like the cost and hassle of a legal fight, but saw no other way out. Once these two things became clear, the spirit of habits 4, 5, and 6 took over, the problem was rapidly resolved, and the relationship continues to prosper. In another circumstance, I received an early morning phone call from a land developer desperately searching for help. The bank wanted to foreclose because he was not complying with the principal and interest payment schedule, and he was suing the bank to avoid the foreclosure. He needed additional funding to finish and market the land so that he could repay the bank but the bank refused to provide additional funds until scheduled payments were met. It was a chicken and egg problem with undercapitalization. In the meantime, the project was languishing. The streets were beginning to look like weed fields, and the owners of the few homes that had been built were up in arms as they saw their property values drop. The city was also upset over the prime land project falling behind schedule and becoming an eyesore. Tens of thousands of dollars in legal costs had already been spent by the bank and the developer and the case wasn't scheduled to come to court for several months. In desperation, this developer reluctantly agreed to try the principles of habits 4, 5, and 6. He arranged a meeting with even more reluctant bank officials. The meeting started at 8 a.m. in one of the bank conference rooms. The tension and mistrust were palpable. The attorney for the bank had committed the bank officials to say nothing. They were only to listen and he alone would speak. He wanted nothing to happen that would compromise the bank's position in court. For the first hour and a half, I taught habits 4, 5, and 6. At 9.30 I went to the blackboard and wrote down the bank's concerns based on our prior understanding. Initially the bank officials said nothing, but the more we communicated win slash win intentions and sought first to understand, the more they opened up to explain and clarify. As they began to feel understood, the whole atmosphere changed and the sense of momentum, of excitement over the prospect of peacefully settling the problem was clearly evident. Over the attorney's objections the bank officials opened up even more, even about personal concerns. When we walk out of here the first thing the bank president will say is, did we get our money? What are we going to say? By 11 o'clock, the bank officers were still convinced of their rightness, but they felt understood and were no longer defensive and officious. At that point, they were sufficiently open to listen to the developer's concerns, which we wrote down on the other side of the blackboard. This resulted in deeper mutual understanding and a collective awareness of how poor early communication had resulted in misunderstanding and unrealistic expectations, and how continuous communication in a win-slash-win spirit could have prevented the subsequent major problems from developing. The shared sense of both chronic and acute pain combined with a sense of genuine progress kept everyone communicating. By noon, when the meeting was scheduled to end, the people were positive, creative, and synergistic and wanted to keep talking. The very first recommendation made by the developer was seen as a beginning win slash win approach by all. It was synergized on and improved, and at 12.45 pm the developer and the two bank officers left with a plan to present together to the homeowners association and the city. Despite subsequent complicating developments, the legal fight was aborted and the building project continued to a successful conclusion. I am not suggesting that people should not use legal processes. Some situations absolutely require it. But I see it as a court of last, not first, resort. If it is used too early, even in a preventive sense, sometimes fear in the legal paradigm creates subsequent thought and action processes that are not synergistic. All nature is synergistic. Ecology is a word which basically describes the synergism in nature everything is related to everything else. It's in the relationship that creative powers are maximized, just as the real power in these seven habits is in their relationship to each other, not just in the individual habits themselves. The relationship of the parts is also the power in creating a synergistic culture inside a family or an organization. The more genuine the involvement, the more sincere and sustained the participation in analyzing and solving problems, the greater the release of everyone's creativity and of their commitment to what they create. This, I'm convinced, is the essence of the power in the Japanese approach to business, which has changed the world marketplace.
Synergy works, it's a correct principle. It is the crowning achievement of all the previous habits. It is effectiveness in an interdependent reality it is teamwork, team building, the development of unity and creativity with other human beings. Although you cannot control the paradigms of others in an interdependent interaction or the synergistic process itself, a great deal of synergy is within your circle of influence. Your own internal synergy is completely within the circle. You can respect both sides of your own nature the analytical side and the creative side. You can value the difference between them and use that difference to catalyze creativity. You can be synergistic within yourself even in the midst of a very adversarial environment. You don't have to take insults personally. You can sidestep negative energy, you can look for the good in others and utilize that good, as different as it may be, to improve your point of view and to enlarge your perspective. You can exercise the courage in interdependent situations to be open, to express your ideas, your feelings, and your experiences in a way that will encourage other people to be open also. You can value the difference in other people. When someone disagrees with you, you can say, good, you see it differently. You don't have to agree with them, you can simply affirm them. And you can seek to understand. When you see only two alternatives yours and the wrong one you can look for a synergistic third alternative. There's almost always a third alternative, and if you work with a win slash win philosophy and really seek to understand, you usually can find a solution that will be better for everyone concerned. Application Suggestions 1. Think about a person who typically sees things differently than you do. Consider ways in which those differences might be used as stepping stones to third alternative solutions. Perhaps you could seek out his or her views on a current project or problem, valuing the different views you are likely to hear. 2. Make a list of people who irritate you. Do they represent different views that could lead to synergy if you had greater intrinsic security and valued the difference? 3. Identify a situation in which you desire greater teamwork and synergy. What conditions would need to exist to support synergy? What can you do to create those conditions? 4. The next time you have a disagreement or confrontation with someone, attempt to understand the concerns underlying that person's position. Address those concerns in a creative and mutually beneficial way. Part 4. Renewal. Habit 7. Sharpen the Saw. Principles of Balanced Self-Renewal. Sometimes when I consider what tremendous consequences come from little things, I am tempted to think, there are no little things. Bruce Barton. Suppose you were to come upon someone in the woods working feverishly to saw down a tree. What are you doing? You ask. Can't you see? Comes the impatient reply. I'm sawing down this tree. You look exhausted. You exclaim. How long have you been at it? Dot over five hours, he returns, and I'm beat. This is hard work. Well, why don't you take a break for a few minutes and sharpen that saw? You inquire. I'm sure it would go a lot faster. I don't have time to sharpen the saw, the man says emphatically. I'm too busy sawing. Habit 7 is taking time to sharpen the saw. It surrounds the other habits on the 7 habits paradigm because it is the habit that makes all the others possible. 4 Dimensions of Renewal Habit 7 is personal PC. It's preserving and enhancing the greatest asset you have you. It's renewing the 4 dimensions of your nature physical, spiritual, mental, and social slash emotional. Although different words are used, most philosophies of life deal either explicitly or implicitly with these four dimensions. Philosopher Herb Shepard describes the healthy balanced life around four values, perspective, spiritual, autonomy, mental, connectedness, social, and tone, physical. George Sheehan, the running guru, describes four roles, being a good animal, physical, a good craftsman, mental, a good friend, social, and a saint, spiritual. Sound motivation and organization theory embrace these four dimensions or motivations the economic, physical, how people are treated, social, how people are developed and used, mental, and the service, the job, the contribution the organization gives, spiritual. Sharpen the saw basically means expressing all four motivations. It means exercising all four dimensions of our nature, regularly and consistently in wise and balanced ways. To do this, we must be proactive. Taking time to sharpen the saw is a definite quadrant 2 activity, and quadrant 2 must be acted on. Quadrant I, because of its urgency, acts on us, it presses upon us constantly. Personal PC must be pressed upon until it becomes second nature, until it becomes a kind of healthy addiction. Because it's at the center of our circle of influence, no one else can do it for us. 
we must do it for ourselves. This is the single most powerful investment we can ever make in life investment in ourselves, in the only instrument we have with which to deal with life and to contribute. We are the instruments of our own performance, and to be effective, we need to recognize the importance of taking time regularly to sharpen the saw in all four ways. The physical dimension. The physical dimension involves caring effectively for our physical body eating the right kinds of foods, getting sufficient rest and relaxation, and exercising on a regular basis. Exercise is one of those quadrant two, high leverage activities that most of us don't do consistently because it isn't urgent. And because we don't do it, sooner or later we find ourselves in quadrant I, dealing with the health problems and crises that come as a natural result of our neglect. Most of us think we don't have enough time to exercise. What a distorted paradigm. We don't have time not to. We're talking about 3 to 6 hours a week or a minimum of 30 minutes a day, every other day. That hardly seems an inordinate amount of time considering the tremendous benefits in terms of the impact on the other 162 to 165 hours of the week. And you don't need any special equipment to do it. If you want to go to a gym or a spa to use the equipment or enjoy some skill sports such as tennis or racquetball, that's an added opportunity. But it isn't necessary to sharpen the saw. A good exercise program is one that you can do in your own home and one that will build your body in three areas, endurance, flexibility, and strength. Endurance comes from aerobic exercise, from cardiovascular efficiency the ability of your heart to pump blood through your body. Although the heart is a muscle, it cannot be exercised directly. It can only be exercised through the large muscle groups, particularly the leg muscles. That's why exercises like rapid walking, running, biking, swimming, cross-country skiing, and jogging are so beneficial. You are considered minimally fit if you can increase your heart rate to, at least 100 beats per minute and keep it at that level for 30 minutes. Ideally you should try to raise your heart rate to at least 60% of your maximum pulse rate, the top speed your heart can beat and still pump blood through your body. Your maximum heart rate is generally accepted to be 220 less your age. So, if you are 40, you should aim for an exercise heart rate of 108, 220. 40 equals 180x.6 equals 108. The training effect is generally considered to be between 72 and 87% of your personal maximum rate. Flexibility comes through stretching. Most experts recommend warming up before and cooling down slash stretching after aerobic exercise. Before, it helps loosen and warm the muscles to prepare for more vigorous exercise. After, it helps to dissipate the lactic acid so that you don't feel sore and stiff. Strength comes from muscle resistance exercises like simple calisthenics, push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups, and from working with weights. How much emphasis you put on developing strength depends on your situation. If you're involved in physical labor or athletic activities, increased strength will improve your skill. If you have a basically sedentary job and success in your lifestyle does not require a lot of strength, a little toning through calisthenics in addition to your aerobic and stretching exercises might be sufficient. I was in a gym one time with a friend of mine who has a PhD in exercise physiology. He was focusing on building strength. He asked me to spot him while he did some bench presses and told me at a certain point he'd ask me to take the weight. But don't take it until I tell you, he said firmly. So I watched and waited and prepared to take the weight. The weight went up and down, up and down. And I could see it begin to get harder. But he kept going. He would start to push it up and I'd think, there's no way he's going to make it. But he'd make it. Then he'd slowly bring it back down and start back up again. Up and down, up and down. Finally, as I looked at his face, straining with the effort, his blood vessels practically jumping out of his skin, I thought, this is going to fall and collapse his chest. Maybe I should take the weight. Maybe he's lost control and he doesn't even know what he's doing. But he'd get it safely down. Then he'd start back up again. I couldn't believe it. When he finally told me to take the weight, I said, why did you wait so long? Almost all the benefit of the exercise comes at the very end, Stephen, he replied. I'm trying to build strength. And that doesn't happen until the muscle fiber ruptures and the nerve fiber registers the pain. Then nature overcompensates and within 48 hours, the fiber is made stronger. I could see his point. It's the same principle that works with emotional muscles as well, such as patience. When you exercise your patience beyond your past limits, the emotional fiber is broken, nature overcompensates, and next time the fiber is stronger. Now my friend wanted to build muscular strength. And he knew how to do it, but not all of us need to develop that kind of strength to be effective. 
No pain, no gain has validity in some circumstances, but it is not the essence of an effective exercise program. The essence of renewing the physical dimension is to sharpen the saw, to exercise our bodies on a regular basis in a way that will preserve and enhance our capacity to work and adapt and enjoy. And we need to be wise in developing an exercise program. There's a tendency, especially if you haven't been exercising at all, to overdo. And that can create unnecessary pain, injury, and even permanent damage. It's best to start slowly. Any exercise program should be in harmony with the latest research findings, with your doctor's recommendations and with your own self-awareness. If you haven't been exercising, your body will undoubtedly protest this change in its comfortable downhill direction. You won't like it at first. You may even hate it. But be proactive. Do it anyway. Even if it's raining on the morning you scheduled to jog, do it anyway. Oh good. It's raining. I get to develop my willpower as well as my body. You're not dealing with quick fix, you're dealing with a quadrant 2 activity that will bring phenomenal long-term results. Ask anyone who has done it consistently. Little by little, your resting pulse rate will go down as your heart and oxygen processing system becomes more efficient. As you increase your body's ability to do more demanding things, you'll find your normal activities much more comfortable and pleasant. You'll have more afternoon energy, and the fatigue you felt that's made you too tired to exercise in the past will be replaced by an energy that will invigorate everything you do. Probably the greatest benefit you will experience from exercising will be the development of your habit 1 muscles of proactivity. As you act based on the value of physical well-being instead of reacting to all the forces that keep you from exercising, your paradigm of yourself, your self-esteem, your self-confidence, and your integrity will be profoundly affected. The Spiritual Dimension Renewing the spiritual dimension provides leadership to your life. It's highly related to habit too. The spiritual dimension is your core, your center, your commitment to your value system. It's a very private area of life and a supremely important one. It draws upon the sources that inspire and uplift you and tie you to the timeless truths of all humanity. And people do it very, very differently. I find renewal in daily prayerful meditation on the scriptures because they represent my value system. As I read and meditate, I feel renewed, strengthened, centered and recommitted to serve. Immersion in great literature or great music can provide a similar renewal of the spirit for some. There are others who find it in the way they communicate with nature. Nature bequeaths its own blessing on those who immerse themselves in it. When you're able to leave the noise and the discord of the city and give yourself up to the harmony and rhythm of nature, you come back renewed. For a time, you're undisturbable, almost unflappable, until gradually the noise and the discord from outside start to invade that sense of inner peace. Arthur Gordon shares a wonderful, intimate story of his own spiritual renewal in a little story called The Turn of the Tide. It tells of a time in his life when he began to feel that everything was stale and flat. His enthusiasm waned, his writing efforts were fruitless. And the situation was growing worse day by day. Finally, he determined to get help from a medical doctor. Observing nothing physically wrong, the doctor asked him if he would be able to follow his instructions for one day. When Gordon replied that he could, the doctor told him to spend the following day in the place where he was happiest as a child. He could take food, but he was not to talk to anyone or to read or write or listen to the radio. He then wrote out four prescriptions and told him to open one at 9, 12, 3, and 6 o'clock. Are you serious? Gordon asked him. You won't think I'm joking when you get my bill, was the reply. So the next morning, Gordon went to the beach. As he opened the first prescription, he read listen carefully. He thought the doctor was insane. How could he listen for three hours? But he had agreed to follow the doctor's orders, so he listened. He heard the usual sounds of the sea and the birds. After a while, he could hear the other sounds that weren't so apparent at first. As he listened, he began to think of lessons the sea had taught him as a child patience, respect, and awareness of the interdependence of things. He began to listen to the sounds and the silence and to feel a growing peace. At noon, he opened the second slip of paper and read try reaching back. Reaching back to what? He wondered. Perhaps to childhood, perhaps to memories of happy times. He thought about his past, about the many little moments of joy. He tried to remember them with exactness. And in remembering, he found a growing warmth inside. At 3 o'clock, he opened the third piece of paper. Until now. The prescriptions had been easy to take. But this one was different, it said examine your motives. At first he was defensive. He thought about what he wanted success, recognition, security and he justified them all. 
but then the thought occurred to him that those motives weren't good enough, and that perhaps therein was the answer to his stagnant situation. He considered his motives deeply. He thought about past happiness. And at last, the answer came to him. In a flash of certainty, he wrote, I saw that if one's motives are wrong, nothing can be right. It makes no difference whether you are a mailman, a hairdresser, an insurance salesman, a housewife whatever. As long as you feel you are serving others. You do the job well. When you are concerned only with helping yourself, you do it less well a law as inexorable as gravity. When 6 o'clock came, the final prescription didn't take long to fill. Write your worries on the sand, it said. He knelt and wrote several words with a piece of broken shell, then he turned and walked away. He didn't look back, he knew the tide would come in.